Die 35-jährige Tuba S. steht heute in Gießen vor Gießen Gericht. wurde vermutlich von es seiner Nachbarin eine mutmaßliche Täterin einer Raubmord. Die Täterin wird vorgeworfen, dass sie sehr, sehr brutal vorgegangen ist. Diese sei. Frau soll aus Habgier drei Menschen Mit stumpfer ermordet haben. Gewalt getötet Für ein paar hundert haben. Euro. Wegen dreifachen Mordes. Warum musste Erich N. aus Gießen sterben? Ich hatte keinen Zweifel an der Täterschaft. Did she murder three people in cold blood? Is the evidence enough to convict her? Is Tuba S. one of Germany's few female serial killers? Gießen, April 3, 2015, was another quiet Sunday, but some residents in the Sudeten Landstraße were woken by the cheeping sound from a smoke detector. On the morning of April the 3rd, we received a smoke alarm signal coming from an apartment in the Sudetenlandstrasse in Gießen. So we set off at full speed. Fire officer Christian Ruppel and his team arrived just after 7 a.m. They could never have imagined what they would find. From the outside, everything seemed fine. There was no smoke coming from any of the windows. When we get a smoke in an apartment alert, 90% of the time, food has been left on the heat, on a stove, or toast has caught fire in a toaster. That's normally the case. But this was no ordinary call-out. When we tried to open the door, we were met with a cloud of thick, black smoke. As we moved into the apartment, we saw that everything was blackened. With fresh air coming in through the open front door, fire fled up in the kitchen. But we quickly put it out. It was then that we saw there was a dead body lying on the kitchen floor. A corpse in an apartment. For crime analyst Mark Hoffmann, not an unusual occurrence. When a body is found, most people at once think of murder or manslaughter. But Germany only has about 400 murders a year. The chances of dying in an accident or from a heart attack are much greater than being the victim of a homicide. The discovery of a body in an apartment doesn't automatically make it a crime scene. Still, the first question that's asked is always, was this an accident or a crime? And it's one fire officer Christian Ruppel asked himself straight away. Something's not right, I thought. There's been a fire in two different rooms, but the hallway in between is undamaged. There's no way the blaze could have spread across the hallway. So the fire must have been started in at least two different places. Christian Ruppel immediately informed the police. In Gießen, Detective Chief Inspector Marcel Schaefer took the case. He had no idea that soon he would be heading a special task force for the first time. There was a blaze in the Sudetenlandstraße here in Gießen. The fire brigade found a body in the kitchen. They informed Special Department K11 and we were asked to investigate. Murder in Gießen? Schaefer, a 47-year-old family man, was still having breakfast when he was called to the Sudetenlandstraße, to a case he will long remember. Our first impression was that one or two things didn't add up. Schaefer's colleagues from forensics had already collected initial evidence, 
But the situation in the three-room apartment on the second floor was still totally unclear. Based on the position of the body, we asked ourselves various questions. Had the man been smoking in bed and fallen asleep? Had he run through the apartment in flames and finally succumbed in the kitchen? Had he set fire to the apartment himself? Later that morning, public prosecutor Thomas Hauburger also arrived at the suspected crime scene. The homicide section in Gießen rang me and gave me the details. The circumstances, they said, were still far from clear. By now the police were speaking to neighbours, but they couldn't help. The body itself posed something of a riddle. At first, forensics could find no clear evidence of violence. On the other hand, the police were puzzled by the fact that the head was covered with a small cloth that had been soaked in red paint. We could make neither head nor tail of the paint-soaked cloth. For the profiler, not necessarily an indication of a crime. From what's found at the scene, it is not always easy to say exactly what took place. Take, for example, the cloth covering Erich N's face. There are various explanations as to how it could have got there. Mark Hofmann studied crime analysis in America. He just loves tackling difficult cases. Someone could, of course, have placed the cloth on his face in order to burn the body or make the face unidentifiable. But when fire suddenly breaks out, it's a normal protective reaction to hold a cloth in front of your face. It's possible and by no means unlikely that Erich N. used the cloth to avoid inhaling smoke and then lost consciousness. We pooled our thoughts as to what might have happened here. I soon got the feeling that a violent crime could have taken place. It is not uncharacteristic for a perpetrator to try and destroy any evidence of a violent crime. It's believed that burning the body is an effective way of doing this. Und das funktioniert zumindest nach deren Glauben sehr gut, wenn man den Leichnam oder gar die Wohnung verbrennt, haben dann we decided that only forensic pathology could determine exactly how the man died. Gießen's leading forensic pathologist, Professor Reinhard Detmeyer, provided the expertise. Our first task in consultation with police officials is to examine the body in situ. When a corpse has been burned, it's first necessary to determine the degree of fire damage to the body. It's also essential to ascertain whether a body shows any damage that was not caused by fire. Inspection of the mouth revealed damage to the mucous membrane of the oral vestibule. This could never have been caused by the blaze. We're talking about the sort of classic injuries resulting from a fight. Then comes the autopsy. So was Erich N. the victim of a violent crime, possibly murder? Now with time of the essence, the forensic pathologist and his team immediately made a detailed inspection of the body they could not have known that in the end their work would play a decisive role in the killer being convicted. Chief Inspector Schaefer and Public Prosecutor Thomas Hauburger continued their investigation. After spending around two hours at the scene of the fire, we left around noon. We sealed the apartment and waited for the results of the autopsy, which had been scheduled for the afternoon. We started our investigation by talking to members of the victim's family. The first few hours of an investigation are extremely important. It's vital to ask the right questions, especially about the victim. In profiling language, victimology means painting a detailed picture of the victim, of his character and his everyday life, because in the majority of cases, the victim is the key to the killer. 
So who was the victim in the Sudetenlandstraße? The name on the door plate, Riconelli, is a stage name. Erich N. used to be a popular magician in Gießen, but that was a long time ago. Unattached, in 2016, the 79-year-old led a secluded life. Erich N. spent a lot of his time at the computer using an internet chat. We covered his entire environment. We interviewed numerous people in order to get a picture of his everyday life. We wanted to know who might have wanted to harm a 79-year-old and for what reason. Did anyone have a motive for killing him, like revenge? We were stumped. We just couldn't find a clear motive. However, one factor stood out. It was generally known in his social circle that Eric N. kept large quantities of cash in his apartment. So we quickly assumed that the money could have been a motive. And because of the victim's tendency to boast of the amount of money he kept at home, the number of possible suspects was considerable. That didn't exactly make our task easier. On the contrary, it extended the circle of people we needed to speak to. When you're dealing with a violent crime, like a homicide, and you have no idea who the perpetrator might be, for days you don't get much sleep. You have to work very closely with the police investigation. You don't even make it home. I certainly didn't get home on that first day. I accompanied forensic specialists to the pathology center. And what did the autopsy show? The findings could be of fundamental importance to the investigation. So had the pathologists discovered anything to substantiate the initial impression that Erich N. had been murdered? During the autopsy, in addition to the monocular hematoma, the damage to the oral cavity caused by external force and violence to the neck area, we also found further injuries, in particular linear rib fractures. Since they were enveloped by blood, the damage was also inflicted while he was alive. With no significant concentrations of carbon monoxide present and no evidence of soot inhalation, it was clear that the blaze could not have been the cause of death. So in Professor Detmeyer's opinion, death had to be attributed to foul play. That became clear after we found signs of strangulation in the form of blood congestion. This is clearly indicated by the presence of minute burst blood vessels in the eyes. Proof that there was blood congestion caused by the victim being throttled when he was still alive. So the cause of death was strangulation. So Erich N. died a violent death, which made his apartment a crime scene. But who would throttle someone with their bare hands? Killing someone with your bare hands is not easy. Even when they use a knife, many killers are horrified at how long it takes and how difficult it is to kill a person. Doing it with your bare hands takes a long time and is extremely hard. Staring your victim in the face for seconds or even minutes shows a staggering lack of empathy. Gießen police set up a Riconelli task force. The team of 12 detectives was headed by Chief Inspector Schaefer. He was under a lot of pressure. By the Spurensuche an sich, um the search for clues was made particularly difficult by the fact that we had a crime scene with substantial soot deposits. So the forensic work took at least a week. The team turned every room upside down. All conceivable trace material, anything that could possibly be a source of evidence, was taken away.
gab es gab tatsächlich erste Hinweise. There were signs that the apartment had been thoroughly searched by the killer. One room had been used as an office. It contained a desk and one of the drawers appeared to have been forced open. On the floor was a large box that had been turned upside down. Otherwise, we found no clear indication that anything had been stolen. There were no fingerprints, but the team did find something. And it was quite an amazing discovery. It consisted of two hairs in the wooden box in the office. That they were spotted at all was simply incredible. Our hopes rose, because the wooden box had obviously been emptied by the killer. The two hairs had possibly been lost when the perpetrator was shaking out the contents. Because of the violence used to murder Erich N., investigators assumed that the killer was a man. The two hairs were taken to the State Office of Criminal Investigation for analysis. What we learnt, though, was disappointing. Since neither hair still had a root attached to it, DNA analysis was no longer possible. So that hope was dashed. The first 48 hours after a murder are vital. If the crime isn't solved in that time, the chances of it being solved at all sink rapidly. By now, two weeks had passed since the body was discovered, but the task force had made hardly any progress. Chief Inspector Schaefer was feverishly searching for some kind of breakthrough. This was his first time in charge of a task force, and he didn't want to fail. During two weeks of intensive investigation, 60 or 70 people from Eric N's immediate environment had been interviewed every single day. They had all given saliva samples and all their alibis had been checked. But there was still nothing to go on. There was not one person we could have said was worth taking a closer look at. After two weeks, we were still at square one. Was the Riconelli investigation heading nowhere? Was Schaefer's first operation as task force leader really doomed to failure? By now the case was hitting the headlines. People wanted to know why Erich N. was killed. What was behind the brutal murder? Murder squad detectives don't give up that easily. At the start of an investigation, it's quite usual for the team to focus on a whole range of suspects. But you notice very quickly when you're on the wrong track. It's all part of the job. We widened the net to include people who had had contact with Erich N. in the past. This also meant people who had at one time lived in the apartment block, but had since moved away. One person came into focus who was now living in Aachen. She'd moved out of her apartment in Gießen in 2015, nine months before the murder. Could this former neighbour provide any information on Erich N? Or did Tuba S know a lot more? Her relationship with the dead man was fraught. In 2014, she had robbed him of 3,000 euros and Erich N had pressed charges. Consequently, on April 25, 2016, she was summoned for questioning. But Cuba S. didn't seem at all suspicious. She was also willing to provide a DNA sample. Suspects usually try to behave the way they think an innocent person would. Someone with nothing to hide probably wouldn't have any problems with providing a DNA sample. And that's what she did. Perhaps she thought she wouldn't come under further scrutiny. When interviewed, she spoke quite freely. She said she'd actually been in Gießen on the weekend in question. Tuba S. had visited a friend and afterwards had travelled on to Lich to play games in a gambling hall. 
Since moving away, she said she'd had no contact with Erich N., nor had she set foot in his apartment. She told us that she arrived at the gambling hall in Lich at 5 p.m. Considering the relevance of the time to the crime, we thought her claim was worth checking. Giving a specific time as an alibi can indicate knowing when a crime was committed. The login data of the internet chat facility, which N constantly used, provided important clues as to when the murder took place. There was much to indicate that the murder had already been committed a day before April the 3rd. We could see that he had been active online around 5 p.m. Then the communication ended. Half an hour later, a friend had rung Eric N, but there was no reply. So we assumed that the crime was committed on the Saturday around 5 p.m. So where was Tuba S on Saturday, April the 2nd, 2016, at around 5 p.m.? Was she really in a gambling hall in neighboring Lich? We questioned a woman who had worked there on that Saturday. She remembered Tuba S and told us she'd played at the gambling hall several times before. But the woman wasn't certain of the date when she'd last seen her. However, she did remember that Tuba S had left the hall briefly to get some money from a cash machine. So could Tuba S prove that at the time of the murder she had made a cash withdrawal in Lich? In early May, Task Force boss Marcel Schaefer received a bank statement from Tuba S, which was supposed to prove that on April the 2nd she had withdrawn money at an automatic teller machine in Lich. Tuba S sent us a bank statement from her cell phone, which she had scanned in. On closer inspection, it became clear that parts of the statement had been doctored. So the statement was not completely genuine. The cash had actually been withdrawn the day before, on April the 1st. Their suspicions aroused, detectives got in touch with the suspect's bank. The investigator's attention was also drawn to two other transactions which Tuba S. had made on the afternoon of April the 2nd. She had purchased disposable gloves at a DIY store in Gießen. Then, at a nearby supermarket, she'd also bought two bottles of beer and a plastic bag. On both occasions, she had used a bank card to make payment. In Tuba S's case, intelligent behavior is intermingled with behavior that's transparent or indeed stupid. Her statement was contradictory, yet to a certain extent plausible. Some parts of it were well prepared or perhaps also cleverly invented. Yet at the same time there were contradictions and of course we also had the poorly manipulated bank statements. Four weeks after the murder there was finally a ray of hope. The State Office of Criminal Investigation in Wiesbaden had come up with something. The evidence was building up. Could Tuba S. now be charged? Had she murdered Erich N? Now the focus was on traces on the body. The State Office of Criminal Investigation told us that the saliva sample provided by Tuba S. had been analyzed and compared with the mixed sample that had been found under Erich N.'s fingernails. Amongst other things, it contained her DNA. The investigators were now certain that Tuba S. had lied. She had met Erich N., but had she also throttled him with her bare hands in his apartment and in doing so left traces behind? Classically, the physically inferior victim will claw at his or her attacker in self-defense. As a rule, the victim will then have the perpetrator's DNA under his or her fingernails. Forensic pathologists in Gießen were determined to find more evidence, so the two hairs were examined once again. 
without a root, obtaining DNA from a hair is difficult. But thanks to state-of-the-art technology, it is not impossible. So could the laboratory provide proof that Tuba S had been in the apartment? Die Technik ist vor ein paar Jahren entwickelt worden, weil sie menschliche DNA, humane DNA nicht nur wie das ja viele It's a method that was developed a few years ago. Human DNA is found not only in the cell nucleus but also in the mitochondria, the minute organelles surrounding it. Die enthalten menschliche DNA. The amount of DNA they contain is far less and has to be prepared in a totally different way. Aber es ist grundsätzlich möglich Nevertheless, this DNA, which does not come from the cell nucleus, can be determined separately. The next step was to arrest Tuba S on suspicion of murder. In late May, Task Force leader Schaefer drove to Aachen to question Tuba S once again. She had no idea of the evidence that was now stacked up against her. Had a former neighbor really turned into a killer? And if so, what was her motive? How would she respond to all the inconsistencies we had identified in our investigation? That was something we couldn't wait to find out. Tuba S. was questioned at a police station in Aachen. It was the first time Chief Inspector Schaefer had actually met the suspect personally. I found her totally unimpressive. But she was in good spirits. I remember that at the start of the interview, I grabbed my chest for a second because something was pinching. She laughed and asked me if I'd had a heart problem. She was very relaxed. You would never have thought that you were sitting in front of a killer. How could a young woman have throttled a man with her bare hands and not show any sign of it? We sat down and I put a recording device on the table. She had thought up a story about events on the weekend in question and was able to clear up inconsistencies. She went into a monologue that lasted a whole hour. There was virtually no need for me to ask her things. That was so uncharacteristic of a normal police interview. She said she hadn't been in the apartment. I must have got mixed up, she said. There must have been some mistake. I've got nothing to do with the murder of Eric N. After an hour, she said, right, I've finished. That's everything sorted. Lying in an interview situation is not easy, because lying is closely linked to nervousness. However, sometimes people lie without getting nervous. They don't show any physical signs of lying. Here I'm talking about psychopaths, professional criminals, or people involved in organized crime. They can all lie without going red in the face. By the end of the interview, which had lasted two and a half hours, we had presented her with all our evidence. She was now nervously sliding back and forth on her seat more and more. But she still denied any involvement in the death of Erich N. So we decided to terminate the interview, have a break and then take Tuba S. into custody. Uh, 34-year-old Tuba S. was driven to Gießen, where she was brought before a magistrate and then held on remand. I was surprised how impassive she was. After all, she'd been accused of two serious crimes murder with robbery and arson, and had never been in prison before, or even held on remand. In Aachen, task force officers searched her apartment. Although they found no evidence with regard to the crime in Gießen, they made a discovery that would change everything. 
It was something that more or less surprised or indeed shocked us. In a dresser, two bank cards were found inside a pack of paper handkerchiefs. But the woman's name on the cards didn't strike any bells. So our detectives rang the issuing bank in Düsseldorf. They learned that the woman to whom the cards belonged had been found dead in her apartment along with her mother. Und auch ihre Mutter ist wohl tot in dieser Wohnung gefunden worden. Ja, wir sind fast vom Stuhl gefallen. We were stunned. We had never even considered that we might be dealing with a serial killer. We had no idea what dimensions the case would now assume. It sent cold shivers down my spine. Had Chief Inspector Schaefer and Public Prosecutor Hauburger really stumbled on the trail of a serial killer? Had Tuba S, undetected by the police, also murdered two people in Dusseldorf? Picture the crime scene in Dusseldorf like this. A woman in her mid-50s and her aged mother lie dead in their apartment. The old lady has evidently been strangled with a scarf. Behind her lies her daughter, who is suspected of having killed her mother and then committed suicide. At the crime scene, the police found tablets which pointed to a mental illness. There was also a suicide note which said, I'm sorry, mummy. So, to the police, the chain of events seemed clear. Since there were no signs of forced entry, police in Dusseldorf saw it as a case of murder followed by suicide. No one noticed that two bank cards were missing, or that shortly after the crime, the cards were used only a few meters from the scene. We discovered that after the crime, which must have occurred on the evening of May 7th, two more withdrawals were made. Just before midnight, 220 euros were withdrawn. The woman had masked her face with two scarves. She also wore glasses, making identification impossible. Her stature reminded us of our accused, so we decided to engage the services of an anthropologist. We showed him pictures of Tuba S. The expert was certain that the woman captured by the security camera was Tuba S. The booty from the robbery in Düsseldorf was a few pieces of jewellery and 220 euros. That two people should die for so little is simply shocking. What is unbelievable is that the crime in Düsseldorf took place only a few days after Tuba S was questioned by Gießen police working on the Riconelli case. Did she really feel so secure? Is Tuba S such a cold-blooded killer? She denied everything. Tuba S claimed that she had merely visited a friend in Dusseldorf and that... They had argued in the afternoon and then gone their separate ways. Her friend had flown off on holiday and she had stayed behind in Dusseldorf on her own. It was a weak alibi. Yet why should a young woman murder three people in cold blood? The question after the motive we also asked. We asked ourselves what her motive could have been. It seemed incredible to us that a young woman should commit murder in two apartments for financial gain. So we took a look at the suspect's financial situation and saw that she had money problems. Before committing the crimes, she had made 72 applications for a bank loan. Someone commits a murder in a robbery because they desperately need money. Yeah. 
An so einer Stelle stellt man sich immer die Frage, ask yourself if she needed money, why didn't she just snatch somebody's handbag or hold up a filling station? They would be far less serious crimes, but that's the wrong question. It only makes sense from our empathetic emotional perspective. But as a profiler, I have to think like the perpetrator and sometimes like a psychopath. For a psychopath, without any deep feelings or emotions, there is no recognizable difference between holding up a filling station and taking someone's life. This is how the police reconstructed the crime. Tuba S. encountered the old lady who was conspicuously wearing gold jewelry, purely by chance. She offered to help her and in doing so gained entry to her apartment. There she strangled the 86-year-old with a scarf and took her jewellery. She then waited for the daughter. When she arrived, Tuba S. threw her to the floor, drugged her and forced her to reveal the PIN numbers for the bank cards. She then suffocated the daughter with a cushion. Afterwards, Tuba S. faked a suicide with tablets and left a bogus suicide note. We have found nothing to indicate that Tuba S. knew her victims, so we must assume that they were chosen purely by chance. When someone commits a murder, it can still have been a mistake, an inexcusable mistake. That's no justification, but it could have been a mistake, something that person regrets and would never do again. Through her second double murder, she confirmed this mistake. As a result, it was no longer a mistake, but a pattern, a personality trait. It seems to be linked so closely to her personality that she would do it again. Our first contact with her was on April the 28th, roughly a week before the murders in Dusseldorf. I still wonder today how she could have committed the crime. Why didn't she say, OK, with Erich N, that was one thing. Revenge could have been a motive. But why, in Dusseldorf, one week later, did she go and commit such a serious crime as a double murder? I've no idea how she could have gone that far. But the case remained complicated for investigators. Tuba S. refused to make a statement, so there was no confession and no witnesses. The body of evidence in both cases was extremely complex. It was typically circumstantial. There were indications that Tuba S. had been in the apartment in Gießen and in the one in Düsseldorf. But would that be enough to obtain a conviction? As public prosecutor, when you believe you have enough evidence to convict someone, you press charges. In this case, that could only mean asking for a life sentence followed, because of the gravity of the offence, by preventative detention. Without statements from witnesses and in the absence of a confession, a case can often look rather shaky. DNA in particular is often weak evidence because it gives no indication as to what actually happened. On its own, it's not enough for a conviction. On January the 17th, 2017, Tuba S. stood trial in Gießen. The case attracted great public interest. Female serial killers are very rare in Germany. For 38-year-old public prosecutor Thomas Hauborger, this was no easy task. Would the circumstantial evidence be sufficient? Could he be making a mistake? His indictment ran to 50 pages. It took almost a year for all the evidence to be heard. The presiding judge was Regina Enders Kunze. At spectacular trials based on circumstantial evidence, you're always tense. 
That's not only due to the great media attention, it's also because your investigative work is also on trial. In court, Thomas Hauburger painted the following chain of events. With the help of disposable gloves and two bottles of beer, Tuba S. gained access to Erich N.'s apartment. She hit the 79-year-old in the face, hurled him to the kitchen floor, knelt on his chest and strangled him. She then searched the apartment, took keys and a laptop and headed off to her friends. Danach. She then went to an apartment and in the evening had dinner with friends. Obviously, she must have thought how she could remove all traces of her having been at the crime scene. So she returned to the apartment, quite extraordinary considering the high risk of being spotted, and set fire to it. She then returned to her friend's apartment in the early hours of April the 3rd and went to bed. That's the chain of events as we in Gießen reconstructed them. Tuba S had a criminal record. She knew Erich N. Her statement was full of contradictions. She had manipulated a bank statement. Prior to the deed, she had purchased disposable gloves and beer. A mixed DNA sample was found at the scene. The evidence all pointed in one direction and led to only one logical and probable conclusion, that Tuba S. was the killer. But how did Tuba S. react to the accusations? Right from the start of the trial, the accused had remained silent. At first she seemed a little tense, but during the further course of the trial, she seemed rather apathetic. An expert submitted a psychological report. It found that the accused was suffering from a psychopathic disorder. And that, the expert said, is what made her so dangerous. But we could never come up with a decisive piece of evidence, like a witness who had seen her coming out of the apartment. So throughout the trial was a complex network of circumstantial evidence. But because of its sheer volume, we were convinced that she was the killer. Fest davon überzeugt, dass sie die Täterin ist. In January 2018, Tuba S. stood to hear the court's verdict. It followed the wishes of public prosecutor Thomas Hauburger and imposed the maximum sentence. Serial killers are extremely rare. It's also extremely rare for women to commit murder. And it's even rarer for women to kill with their bare hands. And for a female serial killer to murder with her bare hands is an absolute exception. That's why the court also imposed preventive detention. There are several hundred men in preventive detention, but less than ten women. This was one of Germany's most spectacular crime stories. And it might not even be over. During the course of their investigations, detectives came across various cameras. Even today, it is not known who they belong to. So could Tuba S. possibly be responsible for other murders? That's what we asked ourselves. We know she's killed three times. So, could she have committed other crimes? The question still remains, where did the cameras come from? Let's look at her modus operandi. Two bank cards were found, which led to a double murder. That leads to the question of who the old cameras belong to. It can't be ruled out that these cameras are linked to murders committed way back in the past, but which were never recognized as such. If nobody identifies the cameras, and that's what it's looking like, we will never know the story behind them. Was it just theft or was it murder?
oder Mordwaffen.